Hold your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. I think I'm gonna be sick. Oh, make him stop, Daddy! Bunker, this has gone far enough. Quite right, sir. Stop the boat! We began with five golden tickets, like five lucky bolts of lightning ready to strike without notice at any point on the map. Did you ever wonder why Willy Wonka was so successful? No, and not because of the slave labor, but I mean, I mean, why this film adaptation was so successful as compared to say, you know, maybe another one. But, well, I think it was because it followed these tried and true story beats, but, but not in the way that you think. And are all these strange conspiracy theories from Wonka being a serial killer to, to Grandpa Joe being the real villain of this film? Is, that, is any of that true? Well, I think I have answers to all of that and how well, following a simple beat sheet will not just make your writing more successful, but it beats writer's block. So I make content to help creators create, from filmmaking tools and gear to making behavioral shifts like removing a writer's block to help you become more creative. Now, writing for a film or, or just for YouTube benefits from following an outline or specifically a beat sheet. In fact, I think it's one of the most fundamental tools that you'll need as a content creator or, or a filmmaker. So let me give you a brief rundown of what a beat sheet is before I apply it to this film. So this specific outline I synthesized from a screenwriting course that I took at UCLA from an amazing professor and screenwriter. And it is an outline I believe he synthesized from years of professional on the job experience writing and studying films, which is, to use the word again, was synthesized from Joseph Campbell's study of the hero's journey. And if, if you don't know about him and you wanna be a writer, then, then stop this video now. I mean, come back and Google Joseph Campbell and the hero of the thousand faces because he's the reason George Lucas wrote Star Wars. But here's the gist of it. So across all of our time, our ancient stories, our myths, our religion, etc., all follow these same paths, generally speaking. And the hero of those journeys is the same figure, the same archetype, the same individual with a thousand different faces. So this beat sheet follows our ancestors' oral tales from eons ago. Now it's translated down into modern cinematic story beats. And because most moving pictures are about 115 minutes long, we can track when each of the three acts, the beginning, the middle, and the end need to take place, and what conflict or resolution needs to take place within them. We also need to know who our protagonist is. So on my beat sheet at the very top is my protagonist, my hero, and what is their wound? What is their injury? I mean, Batman, his wound, he saw his billionaire parents get mugged and murdered in a dark alley in Gotham. Next, their misperception. And it's usually roughly something like, I am not lovable, Batman. And we'll get to Charlie. But Batman, abandoned by his parents, can't trust anyone and has to save the world by himself. Then our hero needs a goal. And this is where our story begins. This is flashpoint one, plot point number one, inciting incident, our page 10 moment. This is the beginning of our plot. Yet, this is our hero's want, not need. So the goal is in, our, in hopes of healing our misperception. So Batman abandoned by his parents at the hand of criminals, his goal is to now clean the dirty streets of Gotham of all crime and all criminals. This is a goal or a want that will not actually heal the wound, nor for Batman is it even possible. But on his journey to achieve that goal, he finds family with Alfred and Robin and allies that will not abandon him. And hence, he is lovable much like our impoverished Charlie and his venture into Wonka land. So I bet you're starting to see how this might work for him and, and all of our heroes. So act one, our beginning first 30 pages is broken up into five main parts with our opening showing status quo, but life out of balance. Now next is our disturbing event or salt in the wound moment. And part three is that page 10 moment. And in, in case you didn't know, a screenplay, a page equals a minute. So at minute or page 10, our inciting incident occurs when our hero is presented with a false solution. In other words, his goal is presented and it is a false solution. So then our hero weighs the pros and cons of the goal. And finally, part five, their decision to pursue that goal at roughly page or minute 25 to 30, leading us into act two, the middle. Now act two is tr a tricky one because there are a lot of moving parts and literally two distinct parts. Part one of act two is defined by the love interest rising, sincere connections taking place. It's as if the goal might lead somewhere good. 
This is where we get an initial success, a, a glimpse into our sincere connection. In next seven, our hero fights doubt, with more evidence emerging that they are in fact headed in the right direction, which immediately follows by eight, our midpoint, at roughly minute 55 to 60. This is our first moment of awareness of negative consequences. Maybe this goal that, that we're headed towards may not deliver us from our misperceptions. So maybe finding the money, getting the girl, winning the race won't actually make us feel loved. And this brings us to part two of act two, where obstacles and the antagonists begin rising. Our villain emerges in this part over our love interest. We see growing resistance, dissent, and denial. Our hero's plan starts to derail. Relationships are in jeopardy. And then 11, our all is lost moment. This happens at page 90. This is the lowest point in the film for our hero. And they need to course correct or else. Which brings us to act three, 12. An emergence with a shift in consciousness and a decision to make things right, which as you would expect, precedes our battle scene, number 13. Now this can be a massive CGI superhero brawl as cities crumble, or it can be a simple inner turmoil where our hero is fighting with our inner demons. A good story hopefully does a little bit of both exterior and interior battle with the villain and the self. So this happens at 105 or 110 minutes. And finally, after the battle, 14, we see life in balance, our resolution. Our hero's wants were not met, whether or not they actually acquired the goal or not, but their need was met. They found the treasure, but it didn't matter because they found love. Now that I have explained it, I think you'll see how easy it will be to plug in Charlie's heroic journey here. So let's do this quickly. And I'll get to the conspiracies at the end. But I think with repetition, this will help firm up the beats of the sheet and when you get this down, you won't be able to unsee it. And, and most importantly, you won't be able to unwrite it. If you fill this out prior to writing, you won't be able to have a writer's block because it'll basically all be written. So here we go, our protagonist, our hero, Charlie. And his wound and likely misperception is just set up almost immediately in a brilliant way. Act one starts with a musical number for the opening. As school ends, we run with kids to a candy shop. And it's a joyous scene right out of the gate. Literally, we are all kids in a candy shop here. And now, the famous song, which Sammy Davis Jr. wanted to perform this song and this part. The director, a documentarian, wanted this seemingly over-the-top sugar rush of a song to be down to earth. And, and it all makes sense now. As the music number ends, we pull out to reveal our hero. On the outside, looking in, and bam! Life out of balance is the status quo here. Charlie is not like other kids by his actions. He's, he's not a kid at all. Now we could imagine what a kid like that, what his wants may be and what his, his wound is. This poor child has to hustle off to work rather than to get to hear a song by the candy man who rains candy down upon Charlie's classmates. And I, I can't imagine a kid like that would feel very special, but that would also be a misperception. Now, the only line I like in Tim Burton's adaptation is at this point, and it's, it's read by the narrator, which is not a great way to handle exposition, but it is a great line that would also work here too. Charlie Bucket was the luckiest boy in the entire world. He just didn't know it yet. So then we get our salt in the wound moment, which mirrors the previous. Charlie on the outside looking in, but now looking into Wonka's factory. So there's a, a creepy foreshadowing here, which, which is a bad omen, and I'll get to this, but David Seltzer, the young screenwriter tasked to rework Raoul Dahl's screenplay, is best known for his horror, The Omen. So there's some dark scenes here, atypical for a kid's film, but then with a bang at eight minutes, right on time, we get our inciting incident, our presentational false solution, and then it's a funny scene. Here, Winkleman, come here. What's happening? Willy Wonka's opening his factory. He's gonna let people in. You sure? It's on the radio, and he's giving truckloads of chocolate away. Class dismissed. No, no, it's only for five people. Class undismissed. He sent him five golden tickets, and the people who find him will win the big prize. Where's he hidden the tickets? Inside five Wonka bars. You gotta buy Wonka bars to find him. Class three dismissed. Charlie weighs his pros and cons from first believing he was going to find it to giving up hope because the fifth and final golden ticket was found. That's it, that's it, it's all over. The Wonka contest is all over. The fifth and final ticket has been found. But wait, it was a hoax. And then, right on time, he finds the ticket. At roughly 33 minutes, and after a lengthy run home and a musical montage, we immediately meet Slugworth, 
the supposed villain. And this was the biggest rewrite out of the adaptation since this part was not in Raoul Dahl's original script, but the writer and director felt it needed a bad guy, and I agree. He also presents us with another conflict. To get rich by helping out Slugworth, Wonka's apparent main chocolate competitor, or maybe you'll be able to live off a lifetime supply of chocolate. But does Charlie pursue this goal? Yes. So he wants to get into Wonka's factory to prove he is special, to prove he deserves love, and he will be able to finally support his family so he gets to be both. To be the man of the house, and he gets to be a child, a kid in a candy shop. So here, some say Grandpa Joe steals the spotlight, springs from bed, and sings that he has a golden ticket, not Charlie or we, which seems a little suspect for a bedridden old man that can't work to all of a sudden be fully capable of singing and dancing, but the book and Tim Burton's film actually handled this much better because Grandpa Joe was fired from the factory, so he would be working if he could. But the song here, an important one to the musical, is sung by a veteran actor, not a boy who actually doesn't sing, who was also acting in his first film ever. So I believe this was the director making a quick decision to give this, give this number over to Grandpa. And as you may have noticed, Charlie doesn't actually sing lead in any of the numbers, which is, is very uncommon for a musical for the hero to not have a solo song. Yet Grandpa's character does add that ethical tension and conflict for Charlie, but he, he's not trying to steal the fictional spotlight here. He's probably actually supporting a castmate in real life. And so act two begins. Our sincere connection is rising and love interest. And love interest does not mean romantic love interest always. It could be a friend, a dog, or an eccentric chocolatier. So like Charlie, we meet Willy Wonka, Gene Wilder for the first time in one of the most memorable scenes in the film, which again, was not in the book due to a grand conspiracy. In fact, it was Gene Wilder's idea. I said, I'd like to come out with a cane and be crippled. And I said, because no one will know from that time on whether I'm lying or telling the truth. And he said, you mean it, if we don't do that, you won't do the part? I said, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying. And this is our glimpse into sincere connection and also a pivotal character development scene for Wonka in his likability and, and trustability, a true trickster archetype. This is not the same Wonka from the book and Johnny Depp probably played it more accurate, an eccentric uh, who maybe should be villainized more than loved. I mean, there's the slave labor and all and firing everybody in the town causing Charlie to be poor. But this is a fantasy, a surrealist, absurdist comedy I mean, the first half of the film is broken up with all these brilliant cutaways that would hold their own within modern sketch comedy. It's your husband's life or your case of Wonka bars. How long will it give me to think it over? And Shall we roll on? Gene Wilder's Wonka and his performance exists, it is on another realm and it is on another level that connects to kids. Even today, my three-year-old son loves it and it, its lessons resonate in a way that's it's hard to examine with a modern lens. And if we really can think of the Oompas as, as like magical people, like Smurfs who worship the cocoa bean, and Wonka's factory is their paradise, which is what we're meant to believe, then Wonka is not a colonialist, but a, a generous candy man who saved and houses refugees from almost certain extinction, but at the cost of his own townsfolk who were stealing his patented recipes from him. So who's to say what's right? Yes. So next, Good. we fight oh, doubt, and evidence that we're heading in the right direction. And boy, is this the payoff for Charlie, the audience, and his dreams. And even with his wounds and misperception, he, he must be feeling special now. Now comes our midpoint, our first moment of awareness that there could be negative consequences for seeking such a superfluous goal. And victim number one is our poor Augustus Gloop. And part two of act two begins as obstacles arise, remember, and our antagonist begins gaining momentum. Is our antagonist Wonka himself? The boat ride may in indicate that, or is it Slugworth who we see again here and his offer hanging over our heads? Is it Grandpa and his questionable morals? But things do get dark and in a way most kids' movies never do. However, I believe this is the allegory of Plato's cave. Now that metaphor of the cave is done in many great films, again from Star Wars, The Matrix, to the Lego movie, but it deserves more time here than I can give it. So if you're a writer, you should again, Google Plato's cave. So our character's plan starts to derail. Relationships are in jeopardy. One by one, victims get picked off by their own character flaws. 
And then our all is lost moment, which should happen at page you know, 90, comes a little bit early at minute 80, but the film's runtime at only 100 minutes. So it makes sense why it's a bridge and why it happens now. But our all is lost moment begins with a fizzy lifting drink kerfuffle. And I'm not sure why I said kerfuffle, but it sounds like one of Wonka's own creations. But anyways, but this moment is great because it emphasizes our two leads main conflict. We have Grandpa Joe, who really is more of the child here with, with more selfish and immature and in need of more immediate self-gratification. And if anything, the, the Oompa Loompa should be singing a song about him dragging him out. Whereas Charlie, the more responsible breadwinner, re prefers to delay gratification and follow the rules, but has a moment of weakness or maybe, maybe strength. He gets to act like a child for the first time and let his guard down and allow Grandpa Joe to persuade him to go off the beaten path. Yet strangely, they both go unnoticed, but we later learn they don't. However, the breaking of the rules does not get them their own loop of lyrics. But there is a moment where all is lost, which seems to propel us to act three. With the emergence slash shift in consciousness and a decision to make things right. From now on, we keep our feet on the ground. Come on, let's catch up to the others. Then we lose Veruca and Mike TV, and I, and I won't discuss the thematic morality issues here, but this solidifies the moral choice for Charlie. And then finally, all we are left with is Charlie, Grandpa Joe, and Willy Wonka. And Grandpa, like us, presumes the story is over, right? So hand over the reward, hand over the chocolate. And as you'll notice, this is not Charlie confronting Mr. Wonka here but our impatient, slightly more immoral, and a lot more immature Grandpa Joe initiating this battle scene. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. But here he is, he is more of our protector mentor than, say, Wonka's tormentor. And this scene begins at minute 90, and this is our battle. And it's not between Wonka and Grandpa Joe in a classic sense, or Charlie and Willy Wonka. It's, it's an internal battle set up by Willy between Charlie and his better demons, Charlie and his temptations, which also would be a good title for this film or maybe a Motown group. But, but since Charlie's character has never been in question, he has been a good kid throughout the film, which is a very unique for a hero to not really change very much. But it is his allegiance to his more corruptible childlike grandfather that is his weakness, his wound of wanting to be the main breadwinner for the family, whilst not feeling or deserving of any special attention, has a choice here. Take the money or do the right thing. Now, one could argue again that the greater good here, since why would you be loyal to such a man like Wonka that you just met who put half the town out of work? But again, as a child story, I think most kids instinctually understand why being honest and not stealing is the right choice. And Gene Wilder's performance made him so lovable that you do anything to stay in his good graces, which really is the icing on the cake of any screenplay is to have, you know, the great beats and all the act components necessary with the right stakes and the pacing in place. And then you get the pure screen chewing charisma of an actor like that. Wonka works also because Wilder works. But here we are at our life and balance, our resolution or our denouement. It is one of my favorite lines and it was not in the original script. Roald Dahl ends the film with Grandpa going yippee originally. And they were on set about to film it that way when, but first the brief nod to all the conspiratorial minded people out there. This film from its origin where the director's daughter in 1969 told her dad, a documentarian mostly, that he should make this book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, into a movie. That first hit theaters in 1971, in two years. A book to film adaptation, a musical nonetheless with, with massive sets was made and which was really meant as a promotional film to push a new candy that eventually was never even released and where the final product was hated by the author and initial screenwriter, Raoul Dahl, because of the liberties that director and Mel Stewart and screenwriter David Seltzer took on the fly, and all of that struggle to write it, produce it, score it with musical numbers, and rewrite it in two-ish years is unheard of. So I, I don't believe any of the conspiracies. I do possibly believe that Snowpiercer could be a sequel to this film, but, but I'll get to that. But, but I don't believe the conspiracies because the movie and its final product was a run and gun production with a script held together with bubblegum and moxie. The ending was changed just minutes before they shot it. 
With a long distance phone call from Germany to the US with an on the fly dialogue change by David, which is honestly one of my favorite lines of the film. And he's on the set. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm on vacation. I said, I know you're on vacation, but I'll tell you what. I am here and there are dozens of people and we're spending a lot of money and we can't finish the film and I want the end line of this picture. He says, well, when do you want it? I said, now. I want it now. Like in the song, I want it now. I want it now. And I thought, well, I will pitch the only thing I can think of, but how pathetic. They all lived happily ever after. So I said to Mel, so what we'll do is they're flying in the air and Willy Wonka looks at Charlie and says in a very warning voice, Don't forget what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he always wanted. What happened? He lived happily ever after. So no, I don't think they had time to scheme anything. And the fact that the film holds up so well still is because it nails all the beats. So if you're having issues with your screenplay, I will be attaching a link to the PDF of the beat sheet below. So fill it out before you even type a single scene. And I can guarantee you, you won't have that type of writer's block that makes you give up on an idea because you'll have all three acts mapped out, allowing you to now write with purpose. So I hope this helps you in your writing, but you can also use this speech sheet to analyze other films. So I do encourage you to try that as well. I think once you notice how all successful films follow this basic formula, it'll be easier for you to do your own construction on your own plots. So I make content for creatives to inspire you to pick up a camera or a pen or to step out of your own way and start making something, anything. Try to, try to make as much content as you consume. And I also guarantee you that you'll just feel more balanced when you do. Now, now this is not my video, but I think it's an interesting next step in analysis. Is, is Snowpiercer a sequel to Willy Wonka? I think this guy makes a great case for it. So maybe click here. And thanks again for your time and attention. My name is Brian Catalano. Please consider liking and subscribing. It helps me out way more than you know. Okay, thank you. Love you guys, bye.